The relationship between physicians and the drug industry doesn't begin once you have your MD or you're out in private practice. It begins the day you hit medical school. Many medical students are given, quote, gifts on their very first day. It's interesting that those gifts are never things like a free dinner at a fancy restaurant or free tickets to a basketball game. They're not even pens or prescription pens. What they tend to be is things that look like they're about education. So they're a textbook or a, an ophthalmoscope that you can look through and say, oh my God, I'm going to be a doctor. And I think what that's about is establishing a relationship, establishing good feelings, and uh, a dependency and a sense of entitlement. I work really, really hard and nobody else is really nice to me, but these guys are really nice to me. And at the same time, the notion that we're all in this together. We're on the same side, the side fighting against disease. Accepting gifts and all sorts of entitlements from drug companies had become so prevalent, had just become part of the culture uh, in medicine, but nobody really talked about it. I started No Free Lunch in 1999, and uh, at the time, the reason was we were, we were moving to an off-site clinic across the street from our main hospital, and I wanted the site to be a drug-rep-free zone. Uh, this meant, though, that we wouldn't have access to free samples that reps often provide and are used for indigent patients without uh, prescription drug covered. So uh, the, uh, the initial idea really was a bake sale, essentially. I was going to print out these t-shirts and pens, coffee mugs with no free lunch logo on them, sell them to raise money uh, to buy drugs, medications for these patients. Uh, of course, out of that came the website, out of the website came the organization, and, and all that followed. Prescription Access Litigation Project is a coalition of over a hundred consumer, senior, labor, legal services, women's health, and health advocacy organizations in 35 states. And uh, we fight against illegal drug company practices that inflate the price of prescription drugs. We do this using class action litigation, lawsuits, and public education. I've been writing about the pharmaceutical industry for about five years now, largely for medical journals, but also for the lay press. And um, I, you know, doctors started telling me these uh, stories about uh, drugs and therapies that they were prescribing, um, and they were shocked. They were horrified because they'd find out that these therapies, one after another, were actually causing more harm than good. And um, they wanted to know how it happened. Uh, they couldn't believe that they were giving medicines to people um, that were actually, in some instances, killing patients. Um, so I started looking into where a lot of the physician education came from and where a lot of the research was coming from. And increasingly, of course, it shows pharmaceutical influence. I was a family doctor about an hour north of Boston for 20 years uh, and did all the things that a family doctor does. And there was this, this seminal moment when I talked to my partner, my family practice partner, uh, who I practiced with for seven years and trusted uh, completely, and said to him, we can't even trust the New England Journal of Medicine or the Journal of American Medical Association anymore. And he looked at me as if I was having a psychotic break, as if I had said, the CIA put a bomb in my gas tank, and if I don't blink five times, the world's going to blow up. Um, to th the thought that, the, that I could say the New England Journal and JAMA were being used by the drug companies and we couldn't trust what was in there was so uh, anathema to what he and all of us doctors are taught. And yet, the further I got into the research after that, the more and more I saw that these journals now are playing a major role in misleading physicians. At the time that I was a sales rep, I had a bachelor's in finance and was working on getting my master's in business administration. So certainly that qualified me to be a pharma school sales rep and tell doctors what they should or should not be doing. I've been on the faculty at UCLA for over 25 years now. I'm currently a professor of medicine and emergency medicine. I also do research and of course I'm also responsible for some supervision of patient care here in our emergency department. In general, um, the main character's experience is closely based on my own experience and I worked for the industry for about 10 years. Doctors will say that they get valuable information about drugs from these pharmaceutical salespeople, and, uh, and that may be true at times, but they need to remember that they're there to sell a product, they're not, not giving a public service announcement. The truth is, is that they are so hurried 
and there are so many drugs out there now. There are thousands and thousands of drugs that simply to remember the right name of a drug and the right dose alone is a task. And so frequently, uh, they just want to know because they know that everyone around them is prescribing a certain drug. Um, they just want to know the name of the drug and the dose. That's a great way to spin it in terms of selling versus, you know, is, is it, am I selling a drug or am I there as an information tool? And it was sales. I mean, there, there's no question it was sales. I don't think any of us, if we wanted, decided we wanted to buy a new car, would say, well, it's really hard to go out and search and learn everything about all the new cars, so I'm going to go to the, deal, the maker of a given car and ask him, is it a good car? we would understand that we really couldn't trust what that person told us and that that wouldn't be better than no information. In fact, in some ways, it would be worse than no information. Let's be honest. They're there to sell their drug. They're not there to educate doctors. They get paid. They get bonuses on how much drugs the doctor prescribes, not whether the doctor is prescribing uh, the most appropriate drugs. So I don't think any doctor would get their information from reps if it wasn't for that the information came with free food and other sorts of perks. If you took away all that stuff, uh, in the 21st century I don't think too many doctors would be getting their information from reps. We've all seen the parade of drug reps that come into the doctor's office. Uh, I was just doing a radio interview the other day and the interviewer had been sick a couple days before and was still fuming that several drug reps got in to see the doctor before he did and the doctor was 80 minutes late by the time all the drug reps got out and he got in to see the doctor. My least favorite part really is when you walk into a clinic and you get the dirty looks from the receptionist who knows, oh boy, here comes another suit who's going to be peddling who knows what. And you give them your business card and they say, yeah, it'll be a couple minutes. And you turn around and you see three more suits sitting in the lobby with two patients. And it was just a sickening feeling. And more often than not, I would just leave. I'm like, you know, I'm not going to burden, you know, the doctors have no time for me that day. You know, it's just, that's the part of the job that really bugged me. There are over 80,000 pharmaceutical salespeople employed by the drug industry in the United States alone. Uh, my understanding is that's about one for every four doctors. Uh, their job is to sell drugs. They are, their job is not to educate doctors. Their job is not to um, provide medical information. They have one job and one job only, to push their product, particularly against other competing products. Doctors should not trust them to give them unbiased and accurate information about their drugs. And frankly, doctors shouldn't let them in their offices. The drug reps are amazingly inventive, oh, the drug companies and, and the kinds of campaigns they will use. Um, to get doctors to prescribe. And again, just name recognition is a big thing. When you've got a field of 20 different antihistamines for people's allergies, you know, which name comes to you first is important. It's like, you know, the more times you see a message, the more times it was a marketing ploy like anything else. It's a lot of stuff that really has nothing to do with medicine. I mean, it's, it's baseballs and golf balls and, and chocolate. Kleenex boxes, Frisbees, cooler cups, Poozies, napkins, plates. Clocks and toy cars and cups and pens. Golf balls, golf shirts, golf tees. Bringing in the physician good lunches so you can have 20 seconds to give your pitch. They will send hordes of reps into the offices with everything from pens to meals to offers of tickets to special ball games. They employ all kinds of tactics, both legal and illegal, many of which are very questionable. At least most doctors are completely unaware of, is that they're being profiled by drug reps and that the drug companies have these profiles on them that not only uh, keep tabs on every single pill, every single shot, every single rectal suppository that they prescribe, but that they even keep psychological profiles on these guys so that they know how to seduce them with their sales pitches. All doctors, sort of in a non-specific way, get these fishing expeditions from time to time. Would you like to be, since you're, we know you're such an expert, Dr. Let's see, what's your name, Dr. X? Uh, we'd love to hear your opinion on this so that you can help us do better things. Doctors, and again, have become accustomed and entitled to accept all sorts of gifts from the smallest to the largest and certainly uh, to the public the, uh, seeing doctors being jetted off to the Caribbean for a weekend with the drug company paying uh, does not make the profession look very good. There's the ski trips and there's the uh, conferences and there's the fancy dinners and the drug companies will do whatever they can 
to endear themselves to doctors. It's hard to be angry at people when they're giving you good food and good wine. You know, taking them to ball games and taking them out to golf and buying them lunch and dinner and I'm thinking, man, I really, I'm glad that we can do this stuff. I'm enjoying this and I hope that I'm getting this message out so that, you know, at least they're making an informed decision, but I hope they're not doing it because they like me or, or that, you know, because I'm giving them this stuff. And I'm thinking, if that is really what's influencing them, that really is creepy to me. The worst things, I think, are some of the uh, smaller enticements. For example, uh, the, the mornings at Starbucks, uh, the doctors come in and get a free latte uh, in exchange for talking to the rep uh, for 30 seconds, that the doctors would sell themselves so cheaply uh, and allow themselves to be influenced and really cheapen the profession just for a cup of coffee, granted an expensive cup of coffee, but a cup of coffee nonetheless is, is, is I think, very troubling. I think it's high time that doctors basically, as a profession, kicked them out of their offices once and for all. It's really hilarious. I mean, I have friends who are physicians who um, know better. I mean, they know that they shouldn't be seeing drug reps, but um, they will actually come out and say, but they're so good looking. And it's true. I mean, drug reps are invariably gorgeous. They are young, beautiful things, male or female. Is it, do you think there was a, a, a rhyme behind the reason as to why the people with, that were pretty and smart and could tell a great story were selected over those with medicine backgrounds? Um, certainly there was. You know, when you're working in an environment where uh, people are coughing up phlegm and puking and feeling miserable. It's just wonderful to have this lovely fresh face who comes in all perky and invariably stroking your ego. And uh, you may think that you're resisting their message and just enjoying a moment with a drug rep and getting a breather. And besides that, you have to learn the name of the new drug anyway. Uh, but the truth is, it has an influence. One of the lines that I often will say that uh, it always brings a big chuckle is I ask the audience, do you know any ugly drug reps? And the, the point of that is that, of course, they don't know any ugly drug reps because drug reps are always not only handsome and beautiful, but they're also well-spoken, thoughtful, smart, reasonable, good listeners. They're lovely people. They, they, too, just like the opinion leaders, have to believe that what they're doing is a service for humanity. They're doing good. I don't think any of them, or certainly very few of them, could do the job well if they believed that this was really all about profits and squeeze an extra dollar at the expense of the public health. These things do influence physician behavior, despite the fact that if you talk to any physician, they will vehemently deny uh, that they would ever be influenced, that their prescribing would be affected by the acceptance of any kind of gift uh, from a drug company. This is an interesting study that was done that shows that, generally speaking, doctors think that their, that their colleagues and their profession is affected by drug marketing, but not them personally. It's a very interesting disconnect between their personal thoughts about their own behavior and influences versus what they think of their profession. But studies have shown also that when you look at doctors' prescribing patterns after they receive you know, visits and other marketing from drug companies, it does actually affect the way they prescribe. So there is a fair amount of evidence that when you take lunches, when you meet with drug reps recently, when you think highly of what they tell you, when you go to sponsored education, that you're less likely to prescribe in an evidence-based way. You're more likely to do things that are distorted and inappropriate and expensive and end up harming the public health. When doctors hear that, they, many, many of them, respond in a way that I like to call the how dare you response. How dare you think that I would be influenced by a pen, by a pizza, by a trip to the Lakers game? There was a great study um, from the Cleveland Clinic that showed that when you, um, uh, when they sent doctors on a junket and uh, educated them, quote unquote, by the drug company about the use of a drug, when they returned to their university or to their practices, not only did they prescribe a lot more of that drug, but all the doctors around them at that institution began to prescribe greater numbers of those drugs. So um, it has a downstream effect. And it's not because those doctors were individually educated, it's because they learned the name of the drug, the dose of the drug, and that the top dogs in their field were prescribing it. Even if a physician is not influenced by the three or four dinners that he or she goes to during the week, somebody uh, is paying for the cost of those dinners. And I would say that it's patients, in fact, who are paying for those gifts in the form of higher drug costs. And so it's, it took 
some time to be distanced from it to say, my goodness, I was influencing them and I was making them, all right, if I'm choosing between drug A and drug B, you know, well, you know, I'll give bug, drug, drug B a shot because, you know, so-and-so told me about it and what have you. And I'm hoping that they're pulling the messages that were the facts. And I, the more I think about it, the less I want to be thinking about it because if I had that much pull and I had that much influence, that scares the living daylights out of me because I had no business telling anyone anything about this stuff. I even had one physician um, who would often bring out a patient chart if she was having a difficult patient or whatever the case is. She'd bring out a patient chart and be like, okay, Kathleen, I've tried this, I've tried this. What do you recommend here in terms of tweaking? And I'm sitting here thinking, I'm a political science major. You're asking me, you know, what to prescribe for this patient. Unfortunately, the tactics used by the, the pharmaceutical salespeople rely on an entire system that is designed to manipulate what doctors understand about drugs. And basically, the, the salesperson is the last step in that. We also have to look at how clinical trials are designed and conducted. Right now, clinical trials are designed by the companies that are seeking to push a particular product in most cases. And unfortunately, they are frequently able to manipulate the design of the study or how the results are presented so that their drug comes out looking more favorable. That obviously is not a good way for us to accurately assess whether a drug is useful and safe. Before 1980, most clinical research was uh, funded by the National Institutes of Health. Academic researchers, quote, snubbed their noses at, commercially, at doing commercially funded research before 1980. When President Reagan came into office, the economy was slow, the ethos was small government, and the NIH funding of clinical studies uh, went down dramatically. The drug companies were very happy to come in and lend a helping hand. Nothing much changed until 1991 uh, because the studies were still being done in universities. But during the 90s, most of that research got pulled out of universities and uh, was being done, was brought to uh, for-profit research organizations. Now, nothing inherently unethical about that. It was more efficient and quicker uh, for the drug companies. The problem is that that gave virtual complete control over the research to the drug companies. They could design the studies. They have control of the data so that ma many of the authors of the most important articles uh, published in our best journals aren't even allowed to see their own data. They don't get free access to their own data. And they have control over publication. So the bottom line is that now 90% of clinical studies are funded by the drug companies. The odds are five times greater that commercially funded studies will support their products. Suffice it to say that when drug companies set the research agenda, do the research and design the research, have tremendous influence over the people who get to write it up, and in fact have tremendous influence over the journals that publish it, because they're very, very beholden to drug companies for their own financial well-being, then it's not surprising that so much of what we think we are learning is tremendously distorted. We have studies that are uh, funded by drug companies, and there have been studies of those studies, and those studies of those studies repeatedly show a tremendous bias. They repeatedly show that they will be far more favorable for a drug if they're funded by drug companies. And we have studies showing that authors who write about these drugs, if they get money from the drug companies, they're going to write far more positive information than doctors, authors, and medical journal articles who don't get money from the drug company. They may be right, they may not be right, but I'd rather hear it from somebody who isn't getting money from one side. And more often than not, you can't get the data. I think it would be a major step forward if uh, the drug companies who sponsor research made their data available to impartial scientists to make sure that the conclusions that have been drawn in the medical journals and that are driving our medical care really are supported by the research data. I mean, right now that data is treated like the recipe for Coke. The data are so hidden and so complex, whether it's gene therapy or whether it's the number of people who die of heart attacks while taking Vioxx, uh, we have to rely on researchers to provide us with that evidence. And um, I think the most shocking thing is to find that that evidence is simply not available or it is distorted. 
and some of it is hidden um, as trade secrets. Federal trade secrets laws, commercial interests, allow drug companies um, to withhold some of this information. And I just recently found out, for example, that the Food and Drug Administration does not report all the deaths it knows about uh, in patients who are on certain drugs because these are considered federal trade secrets. One of the problems in the, in the drug industry is that studies are frequently uh, either hard to find or the results are manipulated by drug companies. Uh, you know, we've certainly heard a lot about that in terms of Vioxx and the heart attack risk. But in the case of Nexium, those studies were, were printed and reproduced, the results, right in the package insert that the FDA requires um, be, you know, accompany the drug in pharmacies. So these were, were not secret. But it's, you know, it's really fine print and not something that most consumers can understand, whereas the ubiquitous television ads touting the benefits of the so-called healing purple pill are very hard to miss. So this is a case where, you know, I guess it was, you could say it was hidden in plain sight. The data that I found on the FDA's website showed for Vioxx that in the company's own study, in Merck's own study called the Vigor study, uh, where Vioxx was compared to naproxen or Aleve sold over the counter, um, Vioxx is no more effective than Aleve, but the important thing is that the manufacturer's own data shows that Vioxx causes significantly more cardiovascular complications, heart attacks, blood clots, and strokes, more than Aleve. And overall, Vioxx is a more dangerous drug than Aleve. So that if I, as a family doctor, prescribed Vioxx for 100 patients in a row, within the next year there would be two and a half serious complications because I treated those patients with Vioxx instead of Aleve. The New England Journal of Medicine article that was published in November of 2000 that was supposedly based on reporting that research failed to include those two crucial pieces of information. So we need to look at, at how clinical trials are designed and administered, but then we also need to look at how medical journals publish the results of clinical trials and other research. Right now, unfortunately, a lot of journal articles are written by physicians who either have a financial interest in the company and the product that they're writing about, or have a consulting arrangement. And frequently, journal articles are also written, uh, ghost written, by companies uh, that basically do this as a business and then sign up a prominent doctor to put his or her name on the article. There's a lot of evidence now that uh, some of those articles aren't even written by those physicians, but are actually ghostwritten by the, the companies for the signature of the opinion leader in medicine who gets the credit and also sometimes gets paid for an article that somebody else wrote. And that gives a false credibility to the results uh, and, and creates a very, you know, un, very uh, incorrect impression for the doctors and other medical professionals who might read the article and rely on it. I saw an article in the New England Journal of Medicine in August of 2000 about Pravacol, which is a cholesterol-lowering uh, drug, reducing the risk of stroke. And it seemed to be a biased article. So I went through it very carefully, and then I got in touch with a research expert in Boston to review my critique of the article with him to see if he agreed with me. So he went through it point by point and said, yes, he thought I was right. He didn't see anything wrong with my analysis. So I asked him if he would be interested in writing a paper with me thought it would be very powerful if a practicing family doctor and a research expert wrote a paper together to help to immunize practicing physicians from the growing commercialism in even our most respected journals. He said to me, well, I'd rather not, I do a little consulting for the drug companies and I'd rather not get involved. And that really was a turning point for me because I naively had believed that the universities were the overseers of the integrity of medical, of medical science and, and knowledge in general. And that showed me that there's enough drug influence in our best researchers so that the oversight function was no longer functioning. And then a year later, I saw a review article in the New England Journal again about Celebrex and Vioxx, and it seemed to be very clearly biased uh, in favor of um, promoting those drugs. I noticed that both of the authors uh, had financial ties to the drug companies and at the time that was against the editor editorial policy of the New England Journal. Now these journal articles are handed out by salespeople in doctors offices. So now if they can't rely on the journal articles they're even more hard-pressed to find out accurate drug information. This transformation in the purpose of that knowledge has happened so quietly 
that the watchdogs not only haven't been able to keep up with it, but the watchdogs are largely drugged. So more than half of the budget of the uh, division of the FDA that approves new drugs and oversees drug safety is funded by the drug companies. 90% of the clinical studies are funded by the drug companies. 59% uh, of the experts who write the clinical guidelines that create imperatives for us to follow have an active financial relationship with a drug that's being considered in the guideline process. About 70% of our continuing medical education that doctors participate in to maintain their state licenses is funded by the drug companies. And we all know that there's now one drug rep for every four and a half practicing doctors. So the drug companies are spending about $30,000 per doctor each year for marketing. The pharmaceutical companies spend a lot of money on marketing. It's probably close to, in 2005, probably close to $20 billion. It's well documented that the drug industry spends roughly twice on marketing what they spend on research and development. And this really demonstrates the drug industry's skewed priorities. And though industry will say the marketing costs don't affect the cost of drugs, they do say the research costs affect the cost of drugs. So uh, though I'm not an economist, I don't see how you can have one but not the other. And that in fact, just like the research costs may affect drug costs, I, I guess that marketing costs probably affect them too. They're more interested in marketing drugs of you know, questionable innovation to the American public than they are in researching genuinely innovative drugs that will be real breakthroughs for diseases that not just Americans but people all over, all over the world are suffering from. So uh, you know, the fact that they spend twice as much on marketing as they do on research really undercuts their argument that they need the high prices that they force us to pay in order to somehow pay for all this supposedly innovative research that really isn't taking place. First of all, they always claim that their prices have to be high because of all the research they do. Well, in truth, most of their research goes towards Me Too drugs. Uh, those are drugs that just simply imitate other drugs that are already on the market that do the same thing. They're not saving lives. They're not changing things. They're just a different drug company trying to get a piece of the market. The notion that we got to learn zillions of things because there are millions of journals being published every month is just not true. In fact, very little that comes out in the 30 years that I've been a doctor has really changed my practice, has really been important. There have been a few things, but you know what? It wasn't hard to know about those things. Those things were so dramatic that you couldn't help but learn about them. Good example, the All Hat study um, compared uh, diuretics, fluid pills, which are very inexpensive, beta blockers, which are very inexpensive, and then three expensive classes of antihypertensive medications. Well, it turned out that the diuretic that costs only $30 to $50 a year was equal to or superior to all the other drugs in preventing the complications of, um, of, of high blood pressure. So the British Medical Journal uh, published a wonderful article in which they interviewed a strategic uh, marketing consultant for the drug companies, and the interviewer said, well, isn't this going to be a problem? Your expensive drug is not as good as a drug that costs $30 or $50 a year. And he said, no, this won't be a problem. We have a $10 billion industry. We'll have 55 promotional events, and this, this data will go away. It'll fade away. And I believe he was right. It did fade away. And this is another thing that gets gross is when they come out, because it's going to go off of patent, right? So it's going to be a generic can be made. Well, they just switch the formula ever so slightly. So we get three more years of exclusivity to the drug and we can still charge our premium prices. Um, next thing we have all seen the TV ads for. It's the so-called healing purple pill. And many people know that it is a successor to Prilosec, which was the original purple pill. Uh, the main difference between Nexium and Prilosec is the yellow stripes they added to Nexium and the price. Now Nexium is seven times more expensive than Prilosec. The piece of information that AstraZeneca is not too anxious to publicize is that there is basically little or no medical difference between those two drugs. Uh, basically Nexium is a chemical mirror of the active ingredient of Prilosec. It's called an isomer. And they've taken pains to try and portray it as though it's different but they haven't been really been able to do so. In fact, the main studies they did to demonstrate that it was somehow superior really didn't do a fair comparison. They compared a 40 milligram dose of Nexium to a 20 milligram dose of Prilosec. And even when they did that, the, uh, the differences were really marginal at best, and in, in one of their studies, no difference at all. When they put them head to head, 20 milligrams of Nexium against 20 milligrams of Prilosec, there was no difference. If they were to say, look, I'm making 
the 19th version of the same drug that never worked in the first place. We have older drugs that are even cheaper than all of them, and they're just as good. And what's more, it isn't even a disease. We're just making it up. Shyness is now social phobia or something like that. Um, if they were to say that this is really just about making money, they wouldn't make a lot of money. So they're smart enough to know that the way to make money is to convince us. And when I say us, I mean at all sorts of different levels that this is really about a noble search for science and health. Objective, cutting-edge science coming out of the top universities in this nation um, is often marketing dressed up as science. Um, you know, you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still marketing. Supposedly, the web opens up medical information so people can do their own research. But studies show that about 80% of the material that people find on the web about medical care is commercially motivated, whether or not it can be, is, it's identifiable as such. And there are a number of groups on the internet that look like these bona fide, disinterested patient groups that would only want the best thing that's right for them. And you come to find out that they're 100% funded by a drug company. Unfortunately, the FDA currently only requires when you are seeking to have a new drug approved that you show that that drug is better than a placebo. In other words, that the drug is better than nothing. That's really not very useful information for the doctor. They don't require the drugs be compared to each other. And that's a huge gap in our medical system. And other countries do require the drugs show that they're an improvement over, to, over what already exists. And do research to show how they stack up against each other. Uh, there are some publications and, uh, and research institutions that are doing this kind of research. The, the biggest one, the most important right now, is, uh, is the Drug Review Effectiveness Project at the Oregon Health Sciences University. And this basically is uh, a meta-analysis where they collect all the different studies comparing drugs within a class to each other, and they make conclusions about how they stack up and which ones are really the most effective. Now, for consumers, much of that research it gets distilled on a website done by Consumer Reports. It's called Best Buy Drugs, and they do essentially for, what the, for drugs what they've done for years for refrigerators and vacuum cleaners and other products, which is tell you within a particular, say, group of heartburn drugs, which one is the best buy, the most effective for the money. So, uh, so things like that are really important resources. And that website for the Consumer Reports Best Buy Drugs is crbestbuydrugs.com. Even when physicians could see through some of this stuff, even when they could say, you know, this, this isn't right, the drug companies would do an end run around uh, the doctors and go straight to the patients with direct consumer advertising. And patients would start demanding these drugs. And what they found was, I mean, a study clearly showed that when patients ask for a drug, um, doctors will often yield to that request, even when they know that's not always the best choice. I had been in practice for 20 years. I closed my practice 10 years before. So all the patients in my practice I had been working with in a small town for at least 10 years. There were many of my own patients that I could not convince that these drugs weren't better. They would come in asking for Vox and Celebrex. And I would say, look, I know as much about this as anyone in the country who's not working in the drug companies. And these are not better drugs. And my patients would say, well, I saw them advertised or uh, even more emphatically, my friend had them prescribed by a specialist, implying you're just a family doctor. And many people said, if you don't prescribe them for me, I'll go to another doctor who will. And I, couldn't, I could not uh, convince people that I was looking at the original research and that it showed that the drugs were more dangerous. The reason 20 million people took Vioxx and many millions, more, many millions, similar millions took Celebrex was because of the advertising. It's because consumers saw Dorothy Hamill skating around on their televisions in those Vioxx ads we've all saw, all seen, that, uh, that so many people took Vioxx. So that's a perfect example of how drug advertising totally skewed what drugs people took and how much they paid. Because Vioxx was many, many more times more expensive than a bottle of ibuprofen which for most people would have been just as effective, and not only would they not have paid more, they wouldn't have been at heightened risk for heart attacks. If there's anything in American or Western society that sort of dominates our cultural life, it's advertising. Advertising costs millions of dollars for the Super Bowl for a minute, and the reason it does is because it works, because by spending a few million dollars on advertising, you make billions of dollars. And the drug industry is very good at advertising. The ads are so beautifully designed to create an emotional connection 
um, and a sense of needing these drugs that they really capture a lot of people's interest. God, you, you can name all these drugs nowadays. You would never, 10 years ago, you couldn't name, unless you were prescribed that prescription, you could not name a drug. And now you could name 10 off the top of your head. Isn't that crazy? There is evidence that the best advertised drugs to consumers are the best sellers. No surprise. So drug advertising is really skewing the market and how much we pay. It's not going to go away. I think that's very unlikely. But it needs to be much more strictly regulated. When President Bush first came into office, there wasn't an FDA commissioner. And he appointed Daniel Troy to be the chief counsel of the FDA. And one of the first things he did was made, make a rule that all of the advertising infractions that had been responded to in a matter of days previously because the committee that looks at them, the division that looks at them, would send out warning letters or uh, sanction letters. All of those uh, problems would have to come to his office and the delay in sending out warning letters, meaning protecting the public from ads that cross the line that uh, in some way uh, misrepresent the drug or overstate the drug's benefit or understate the risks, um, was grossly delayed. Right now, the FDA does not require drug companies to submit television ads or any other drug ads before they air. They only have to submit them after the fact. So the ad will already be on TV or in a magazine. And the FDA, if it eventually gets around to doing something about an ad it considers deceptive, may be too late. Um, Representative Henry Waxman has done studies about how long it takes the FDA to act on deceptive advertising, and there are very lengthy delays. Usually four to six months, I think, is the average. By four to six months, many of these ads have stopped running. The damage is done. The expression is closing the barn door after the horse is gone. Well, the FDA is, at best, shutting the, shutting the barn door halfway after the horse is long gone. So we need, you know, we need better enforcement by the FDA of direct consumer advertising. And we also need more disclosure within drug ads of exactly what the drug is for, what its risks are, who it should be used by, and basically fuller information so that people can make an intelligent choice. Right now, drug ads are basically a shameless promotion with a little bit of risk information at the end that frequently people don't understand or that's obscured by graphics, sounds, things going on in the commercial that make it hard for people to take in that drug information. I think it's really short-sighted to think that this is a matter of bad drug companies or bad people pulling things over on us. They're doing what they're supposed to do. If we want it to be different, we have to insist on it. And the, way in, the ways in which we insist on it is multi-pronged, but it includes our government. Of course it does. Right now, our government is not terribly interested in making any reforms that would be useful because they're very beholden to the drug companies. If we want to change that, we have to make them beholden to us. We have to have the clout and the influence in the organization to make it that they can't blithely go along making the FDA be something that has been widely and uh, famously called a servant of the drug industry. We have to make it the FDA is a servant of us. Should doctors take drug samples? Well, I took drug samples and I thought I was being like a Robin Hood because I had expensive drugs and some of the drugs are better than the alternatives. I had expensive drugs that I could give to patients who couldn't, uh, had no insurance or couldn't afford them. It was only until I left practice and started doing re research full time that I realized I thought I was being Robin Hood and they were playing me like a violin because their real job is to get those drugs into my drug closet so that I would learn how to use the expensive drugs, learn how to use their brand of expensive drugs, what the doses were, what the side effects were, what the timing was of changing doses and following up patients so that I would get comfortable with their drug and then have it be one of the two or three that I knew how to use in that class. In fact, industry spends over half its promotional dollar on, on, these, on the retail costs of these free samples and its promotional costs, not charity, and that's not the charity budget these samples come from, and for good reason, because uh, these samples, of course, are always the newest, most expensive drugs, and uh, once the doctors and patients are hooked on these drugs, it, it becomes the drug that the doctor is most likely to use at a later time. Well, they never give samples of aspirin. Aspirin is probably the most important drug that we use today in our society. They don't give samples of aspirin because Aspirin's inexpensive and people could actually use it and it would be really, really helpful. They give samples of the most expensive, fanciest new drugs. And they do that because they want us to use these drugs. So, and there's a lot of ways in which it helps us use these drugs. First of all, you start get used to using them and 
handing them out, and you have to know exactly how you use them and what are the terms and what's the dosage and all that stuff. So you get familiar with them. That's good because the next time you come to write a prescription, you're going to think about that new drug. In addition, if you gave a sample to somebody and now they, the next time they need a prescription, well, you don't want to change their drug, so you've got to write the same sample. I knew what a huge marketing tool that the samples were. It was not just a, a benevolent act of kindness by the pharmaceutical industry. I, in fact, was evaluated by how much I could push samples on my physicians because as reps, we would often go into the, into the offices and leave samples for the physicians and we would check back maybe every two weeks to see if they needed more samples. We would be sick to our stomach if those samples weren't moving off the shelf because you know what, ultimately, you know, the, if, if the doctor's using more samples, that means the doctor's market share is increasing. And if they weren't using my samples and they were using one of my competitors, it was a sickening feeling because I knew that I was, you know, I wasn't performing my job. There was this article where a, a group, I believe it was in Maine, a small town in Maine described a very different approach to samples. They decided that it really, they weren't interested in meeting with the drugs therapy anymore was taking too much of their time, they didn't like what was going on, they didn't like the things they were given as samples, etc. They didn't want to be coerced into using these fancy, expensive new drugs. So what they decided to do instead was they decided to each contribute $100 a year. For the $100 a year, there were nine physicians in this small town. So they had $900 between them. And they gave it to the one local pharmacy that existed in the town. And with the $900, here's what they bought. They bought all the samples they could ask for, for a whole bunch of common diseases. But the samples weren't fancy new expensive drugs. They were things like aspirin and hydrochlorothiazide, a very inexpensive diuretic, and inexpensive beta blockers, and nitroglycerin, and all the drugs that really matter, but that cost nothing. Inexpensive antibiotics, not the fancy new, tremendously expensive antibiotics, but the simple ones that work. So they got all the samples they could possibly have for much less than $900 because the $900 also bought them education because the pharmacy also agreed one night a month to prepare a seminar for which they would take some of this $900 as profit and they would have one of their pharmacists prepare a seminar on a drug topic of the physician's request. The doctor said, you know what? we really could trust this as education because this guy was beholden to us. We were paying him. Nobody else was paying him. And he didn't have some other financial conflict of interest. Secondly, we got samples for things that are really useful and that we wanted to use. Third of all, for $100 a year each, we saved all that time that we would have had to spend with these drug reps. Now, I've told this story to groups of doctors probably on 15, 20 occasions. And over the years since I've told it, I've had a half dozen physicians come up to me afterwards and say, you know, I heard you say that five years ago, and we've started in our town, and boy, it's great. I don't think you have to um, sell your soul to get these samples. The reputation of drug companies is abysmal. It actually matches that of tobacco companies. So the word is out, um, but the problem is so entrenched in our institutions that without public action, where we actually separate drug company influence from physician education, from payments to the FDA, from uh, advertising in journals, from research, uh, from patient advocacy groups, uh, from m all these areas, we're not going to be able to get at the truth because these actual data will be withheld uh, the con scientific conclusions will be spun in ways that we will not really learn uh, the truth. And again, uh, as with Vioxx, we could have known years ago before many people died, but we didn't. They don't want doctors thinking this is about selling product, no matter how useless. They want doctors to believe it's about curing disease. So they advertise the doctors in all sorts of ways. They give us pens, not because they think we really care that much about a pen, but because they think it'll create a relationship of friendship and collegiality and uh, uh, trust. And it's not just pens. It gets bigger and bigger depending upon who you are and how much they need you. And it's not just doctors. It's opinion leaders. And it's not just opinion leaders. It's medical societies. And famous public medical societies and agencies, 
I don't want to name specific names, but any one of the big public agencies or publicly known medical groups, they all have relationships with drug companies, and the drug companies spend a lot of time wooing them and giving them money and pretending that it really is all about science and curing disease. And it's not just the societies. It's the journals, which are tremendously beholden. And it's not just the journals. It's the universities, which have uh, take enormous amounts of monies from the drug industry. And it's not just the universities. It's our government, and it's the NIH, and it's the CDC, and it's the FDA, and it's the Congress, and the White House. All of these have a very, very, very powerful financial relationships with the drug industry. Now, the issue is, ought not to be a liberal or a conservative issue. The issue is one of the benefit to society. And not only is our health care being compromised by this biased information, and not only are 18,000 Americans dying every year because we're the only country that doesn't have, an in, industrialized country that doesn't have universal health coverage, but the marketplace itself is now being distorted. And now this, this crisis in the cost of medicine is much like what we saw when the, there was a crisis in the confidence of the securities industry, when um, the SEC had to step in and be bolstered to restore confidence in the securities industry. We now, it's a bipartisan issue to restore confidence in our medical knowledge. And unless politicians from both sides of the aisle step up to the plate, it's not going to happen. And that won't happen unless the public demands that their politicians do so. But again, uh, I'm hopeful that we don't need more regulation, that just getting doctors, educating doctors, getting them to do the right thing may be enough. I do believe that ultimately the responsibility lies with the physician who's going to write the prescriptions. And that's why I feel that one of the biggest things we can do, one of the biggest solutions we can provide here is to raise this awareness with physicians and future physicians about the tactics the industry uses to promote their drugs. Drug companies will do whatever they can to form relationships that they can le then leverage into getting doctors to prescribe their drugs. In in many ways, it's us doctors who are responsible for this because we ought to know that they're not doing this marketing out of the goodness of their heart. They're doing this marketing to get us to use their drugs. And that is more often than not going to take us away from truly evidence-based medicine. Making little rules about you should do this or you shouldn't do that or the size of the gift. It can be a pen, but it can't be a fountain pen. That's all silly. If we really want to change that, we have to separate out functions. We have to go back to being physicians who take care of our patients and don't get anything out of meeting with proprietary sources. We as scientists have to be scientists rather than people whose career is made or not made by how much money we get from somebody who's trying to sell us something. We as editors should be beholden to, the, to our readers rather than the people who are paying all this money for our journals. I have one message for medical students and that is just say no. No free lunch, no pens, no giveaways. Remember why you went to medical school in the first place. Remember why you're studying to be a doctor. It's to help people, it's to serve people, it's not to serve the interests of pharmaceutical companies. It is work to find independent information about drugs, but take that extra time and, uh, and don't allow drug reps into your office. They'll start in on you on med in medical school and it just gets worse from there on in. The sooner you say no, the easier it is to keep saying no. But you also, and not just in your own practice, you need to work for reform in your profession, in your chosen profession, to ensure that it continues to act with the integrity and ethics that characterize medicine. And don't let it be corrupted by corporate influence.